morning and welcome. I'm Maria Spasevsky, Events and Membership Manager at SAPCA. Thank you for taking the time to join us today as we discuss three ESG risks that should be on everyone's radar, biodiversity loss, gender inequality, anti-bribery and corruption risks. The control risks team will provide some valuable insights today. And don't worry about taking notes, we will share the webinar recording with all the attendees. Today's webinar carries one and a half CPD points. So please stay tuned for the whole webinar to qualify for your points. The CPD certificates will be sent out within a week of the webinar. Feel free to drop any questions on the topic or share your struggles and experiences in the Q&A box on your screen. Or you can raise your hand to ask a question live. We will answer your questions towards the end of the webinar. Control Risks will also be joining us at the SAFCA Private Equity Conference taking place on the 25th and 26th of May. They are the sponsors of our Convey stream and they will be hosting a co-create session. Can digital and remote due diligence be successful? So without further ado, let me hand over to the Control Risks team. Control Risks is a specialist risk consultancy and the pros who will take you through the topic today. So I'd like to now hand over to Bassani, Catherine and Clara. Thank you, Maria, for that really warm welcome. It is an absolute pleasure to be joining you all today with what I hope is going to be a really interesting discussion and a look at some of these sector agnostic ESG risks. So to set the scene for this webinar, I want to talk briefly about the concept of materiality in ESG. When it comes to ESG factors and how they're considered within the investment landscape, only those factors that affect financial returns are considered material. In fact, financially material ESG factors are defined as those factors that could have a significant impact, positive or negative, on a company's business model and value drivers, such as revenue growth, margins, required capital and risk. Now, the key word in that definition is impact, but the focus is exclusively on impacts to a business rather than thinking about impacts created by a business. The problem with a focus on materiality is that companies or investors in companies can miss impacts created by other companies. And again, these can be positive or negative on human rights. So we're looking really at the impacts on stakeholders rather than shareholders. The UN points to a wide range of research over the past decade that proves the correlation between human rights risks, corporate financial performance, and risk to investment. And they're calling on investors to engage with ESG reporting frameworks, benchmarks, and data providers to ensure that the research methodologies, corporate performance, corporate performance data, and advisory services used to assess investees are aligned with the UN guiding principles, and reflect real world outcomes for people. So on today's webinar, we'll be looking in more detail at three ESG risks that are material to every sector, sector agnostic, and can create negative human rights impacts if poorly managed. As Marie mentioned, they are biodiversity loss, gender inequality, and bribery and corruption. Managing these risks can create exactly the sort of positive real world outcomes that the UN wants investors to focus on. So I'm going to start by introducing my colleagues who, like me, work on risk management of ESG factors, and they each have a unique perspective about the opportunities and challenges that ESG presents to investors. I'm going to invite each of them to briefly describe what they do at Control Risks. Um, some of you may have seen that my colleague Joyce was supposed to join us today. Unfortunately, she's not able to, but my colleague Bassani has stepped into her shoes. Um, so Bassani, I'm going to start with you first. Thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so my role in Control Risk is to lead our business intelligence practice uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, my main focus in that role is to help our clients understand their counterparty risks and of specific concern in dealing with third parties or issues around um, you know, bribery and corruption, which are inevitably uh, concerns when dealing with uh, third parties. Uh, thank you. Clara, over to you. Thanks, Bassani, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm dialing in from London, where I also work on the control risk, business intelligence, and ESG uh, due diligence teams focused on sub-Saharan Africa. I was previously based in Nairobi for three years and recently moved back to London. Um, 
you can see behind me there. Um, but really looking forward to getting into these, these issues today and hopefully having a really productive discussion. Thank you, Clara and Bassani. And Clara, particularly for your early start this morning, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. So now we'd like to get all of our attendees involved today. And we're going to be conducting a few polls throughout the discussion. Those of you who've joined us on previous sessions like this will remember this format. So we're also at the end of the session going to ask people to add their comments on the three ESG risks that we're discussing today. And we're gonna ask you to share your thoughts on other sector agnostic ESG risks. So please be ready with your ideas. Okay, so let's get people warmed up. We're gonna start with our first poll. Investor appetite for ESG and sustainability keeps on growing. There are considered to be five categories of ESG investment strategies. Which of the below strategies are you currently using or are you most interested in? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to have a think about it. It is multiple choice, uh, so please feel free to select whichever ones are most applicable to you. Okay, Maria, if we have uh, sufficient numbers, let's have the results, please. Okay, that's interesting. So we have a couple of high numbers here around the impact investing and also the combination of multiple strategies. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. And thank you everyone for, um, for taking the, uh, the time to do that poll for us. What's also interesting is that SAFCA conducted um, a PE industry survey, survey last year in 2021, which found that 45% of funds said that they had specific impact investing mandates. So that is very closely aligned with what we've just seen but that a large number of funds also said that they were likely to consider implementing investing, impact investing mandates in the next five years. So the direction of travel is clear. ESG is here to stay. Impact investing is here to stay. We are now going to turn uh, to a deep dive on those three thematic ESG issues that we talked about. And you'll notice that we're going to be touching on each of the E and the S and the G, because it's important to, uh, to realize that they're all interconnected anyway. So, Clara, you mentioned that you are you were based in the Nairobi Office for Control Risk for three years, and I know that you continue to have a strong focus on clients in Africa. You've also recently published an article on biodiversity loss in Africa. So what is it about this ESG risk that makes it, as you describe, sector agnostic? Thanks, Catherine. So biodiversity loss is becoming an increasingly salient issue for investors and corporates due to climate change. The impacts that biodiversity loss will have on the physical transition and mitigation risks, which are the risks that we're trying to increasingly ask our clients to think about, uh, posed to organizations by climate change, are going to be increasingly captured in data that is collected by organizations as part of their ESG monitoring and reporting and through their journey to net zero emissions. Biodiversity loss accompanies climate change in a number of ways. And while it's typically associated with deforestation, so the mental image you might be conjuring up right now is the extreme example of the burning of the Amazon rainforest. More commonly, anytime we alter any form of ecological landscape, whether through large infrastructure development like building a road or installing a wind turbine, to tilling the soil for agriculture, to laying fiber optic cables for a telecoms network, biodiversity of the local ecosystem could potentially be impacted. Because all of our value chains ultimately extend to physical assets, Biodiversity loss is a sector agnostic issue. It affects everyone from food producers and retailers whose farms may be contributing to deforestation or native grass cutting, displacing local wildlife, to consultants such as myself who may work in office buildings but source the energy that keeps the office lights on from wind turbines or power lines that affect local bird life. Birds being affected by power lines is actually a really relevant case in point. Um, just a few weeks ago, an article was published by the uh, UK's Times newspaper reporting that electrocution by electricity pylons and poorly insulated lines were now the leading cause of mortality amongst Kenya's birds of prey, leading to population crashes. So while the population crash of buzzards and vultures may at face value seem like a fairly niche concern, science tells us it's not. When bi biodiversity loses, even if it's just buzzards and vultures, frankly, we all lose. 
we know that all flora and fauna play irreplaceable roles in our ecosystems, which secure the ecosystem's health, ultimately leading to the provision of the free ecosystem services we all rely on to live, like fresh water, clean air, and carbon sequestration. Due to its importance to healthy life on Earth, biodiversity loss is increasingly being viewed through a well-being lens, so cutting across through any perceived silos of environmental, social, and governance, material issues that impact us all. Um, resilient biodiversity means that communities are happier and healthier, improving so organizations' social license to operate. It also reflects strong governance systems that ensure uh, infrastructure development is taking biodiversity into an account as an integrity risk. Because of all its added benefits, biodiversity is also being factored into financial institutions rethinking on GDP and wealth and how both are increasingly losing meaning without including robust definitions and measurements of social and natural capital, the latter of course being heavily reliant on biodiversity. With all of the regulatory and financial progress being made to ensure the true value of natural capital is being captured and monitored through ESG reporting and included in financial disclosures, it is increasingly important to ensure that you are adequately addressing the risk of biodiversity loss in your operations. This will ensure the medium and long-term sustainability or resilience of your operations and make sure that you're accurately representing your assets value. For those of you who are already reporting using the task force uh, for climate-related financial disclosures, otherwise known as the TCFD, uh, you know that this is something that they really strongly recommend. So for an investor, that means ensuring that your investee companies are effectively detecting and managing these, these issues and then reporting back to you on how they're performing. I'll pause here and let everyone take a breather. Um, I think we have another question for the audience lined up about this. Uh, yes, there you go. So, a study has been recently published that took data from the IUCN, which we know maintains the red and green list of threatened species worldwide on biodiversity loss in Africa. So just a quick fun throwaway question, but what do you think is the biggest threat to biodiversity loss in Southern Africa? So we'll just give you guys a couple more seconds to pick one. Great, yeah, so agriculture is, is the one. So unsurprisingly, the agricultural expansion, agricultural sector's expansion in Africa is the biggest threat to biodiversity. Um, and it, when, when it comes to climate impact, the agricultural sector extends well beyond the food um, to consumer industry, into value chains, into various other industries uh, in, within the economy. So making sure that our supply chains contain agricultural inputs that are taking biodiversity loss into account will be important to maintain a healthy ecosystem and guaranteeing long-term resilience for both organizations and investors. Great, thank you so much, Clara. Um, that was a really eye-opening uh, introduction to the topic. I know the article that you're referring to in the UK newspaper, which I read recently, and I can remember that some of the, um, the bird species that have been affected the, the, the numbers are shocking. It was something like 90% of one particular type of buzzard or vulture, um, yeah, 90% decrease in their numbers in 40 years. So they're now on those sort of critically endangered, you know, approaching extinction kind of lists. So this is, uh, this is real, it's happening. Okay, so Basani, over to you. Um, fundamental to managing these biodiversity risks that Clara's described is good governance. You regularly work with companies on a very different type of risk, uh, which also depends on good governance, and that is uh, bribery and corruption. Uh, that's right. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so we all know that you know companies looking to invest in Africa um, have to give particular focus to transparency and financial crime. Uh, in my experience, has ultimately you know been the you know been the result of poor corporate governance. Um, so I'd like to gauge the audience feeling about the salience of this issue before I move on. Um, so if I could just put up that quick poll, thank you. Um, and just to read out the question, uh, Transparency International is corruption perceptions index is widely used as a measure of corruption risk in emerging markets. According to its surveys, what percent of sub-Saharan Africa is perceived to have entrenched corruption? So I'll give you all just a, a minute or two to just uh, provide your answers on that. Okay. 
Great, thank you. Um, and yeah, looks like most of you have got the correct answer there. So the correct answer is 90%. 90% of sub-Saharan Africa is perceived to have uh, entrenched corrup uh, corruption. Now, comparatively, about 64% of Asian countries are perceived to have entrenched corruption. So, you know, quite a large disparity there um, between, you know, two emerging uh, centers of emerging markets. In reality, we know that the level and nature of corruption varies from country to country. Um, you know, the classic example being, say, Botswana in our region, which is one of the least corrupt countries in the world, ranking higher for transparency than, say, Italy or Spain and Poland. Um, other sub-Saharan economies present a more moderate corruption risk. Uh, for example, Ghana, South Africa and Senegal rank on par with other emerging markets uh, such as um, Saudi Arabia, Brazil um, and China. Um, but we also know that, um, you know, the governance and ABC risk cut across all sectors and industries. Um, so. That said, certain sectors and industries lend themselves to more uh, acute risks in certain transactions or of a, of at a certain nature uh, than others. Um, investors and their advisors need to be sensitive to this and, and approach ABC and governance assessments, you know, and that's from risk assessments to investee company policy development right through to ESG transaction and, and due diligence uh, with sector and industry specific issues in mind. Thank you, Basani. And can you give us any specific examples to illustrate what you're talking about? Yeah, certainly, Catherine. Um, I think um, several, you know, sectors kind of lend themselves towards, um, you know, high ABC risks. Uh, so sectors like the extractives, construction, telecommunications, really anywhere where the ability to operate depends on the award of permits or licenses from, you know, local or national government automatically presents uh, as spaces where the corruption is so high due to the control that, you know, certain decision makers have in the award process and how those decisions can influenced by illicit financial inducements. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work, for example, in assisting clients uh, invest in data centers, for example, across the continent, uh, where one of the key risks there lies around the land upon which those data centers are built uh, and how that land and the permits, uh, you know, allowing uh, the operation of these data centers has been um, acquired. Um, so, you know, looking at the specific issues around the probity of land acquisitions and permit um, uh, approvals is a key is sector specific risk that we look at um, you know when considering um, you know pre-investment due diligence in that particular space great thank you and i know you have a strong focus on bribery and corruption you wouldn't necessarily consider yourself to be an esg practitioner but do you think of bribery and corruption as an esg risk yeah, certainly not a ESG uh, a specialist, but inevitably you have to think of these things, uh, you know, together. So corporate governance, so with the laws, uh, standards, and obligations that an organisation mm -hmm. abides by or holds itself to in order to operate in a compliant, purposeful manner, uh, I suppose, is the backbone to all ESG risk management systems and opportunities uh, to create impact. So good governance means that uh, an organization is uh, better equipped to manage the to manage its ESG risks and performance. Uh, if an organization is struggling with bribery and corruption, you know, this is usually a symptom of poor governance uh, and means that the organization likely is less able to deal with other ESG risks and opportunities to um, governance. Corporate governance specifically has its own uh, long standing and very well established standards, laws uh, and obligations. Together, together, these set out the principles that companies and their direct and their directors need to uh, to follow to ensure that uh, transparent governments of companies in the interests of the of the shareholders. But for investors, when they think of the investees, uh, governance increasingly relates to running a company in the interests of its stakeholders. Um, this is much broader group than shareholders and includes employees, uh, local communities, customers, uh, and others impacted by a company's activities. Um, and you know you'll appreciate how how wide a group that is. Um, so there are numerous <clears throat> there are numerous frameworks like the uh, task force on climate related financial disclosures, <clears throat> which Clara's uh, discussed previously, and the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board um, that can help organisations manage and report on their governance risks. Um, these frameworks address governance specifically as component parts of uh, sustainable business on par with climate, environment, and human rights, uh, and consider governance in terms of the impact a company has on a wider group of stakeholders. Um, however, bribery and corruption and financial crime are often not captured comprehensively with these, within these frameworks, uh, even though they represent a, a common manifestation of poor governance, both in Africa and elsewhere in the world. 
Mm, absolutely. And Basani, are your investor clients treating bribery and corruption as an ESG risk? And if they are, what good practices can we draw from that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, look, I mean, I think some of our clients are now treating anti-bribery and corruption as part of the governance prong of ESG, but many are still working out how to integrate the two. Uh, so most of our investor clients have established ABC-focused deal screening programs, and you know, many work closely with the investees on setting, uh, you know, setting up governance frameworks or enhancing their corporate governance setups. Um, I'd say that often these programs need to be augmented or reviewed to include wider governance issues, uh, like the capacity of management teams to detect and manage uh, social and environmental risks. They often also need enhancements to support uh, investees in, in implementing uh, government programs. To complicate matters, there's still yet no uniform and consistent framework for assessing transparency, corruption, bribery, risk within uh, ESG standards. So it's therefore a bit tough to distill consistent examples of good practice. Um, I think I can quickly talk through three key anti-bribery and corruption considerations that can demonstrate ESG commitment uh, and integration uh, to ESG investors. So first of all, be third party risk management through due diligence. Um, it's a tested and thoughtful third party vetting program. Uh, well, I'd say a, a, a third party vetting program is still one of the best ways to manage bribery and corruption risks. Um, third parties, you know, consultants, agents, third party business suppliers, um, MA targets or joint venture partners um, are still the most. Uh, you know, significant exposure to ABC risks, uh, you know, linked to the unfair attribution of contracts, facilitation payments, etc. Um, and for the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, this creates an important ESG um, exposure. Secondly, I'd say locally nuanced risk assessment. Um, so organizations should apply a local context lens and address the risks uh, and conduct most likely to result in anti-bribery violation. Uh, you know, it's important to remember that not all anti-bribery violations um, are equal or equally harmful for the organization. Um, you know, so the risk assessment should include a, a category and ranking for medium to high risk uh, activities for which a violation could produce a high risk for, you know, legal or reputational risk exposure. Crucially, um, a risk assessment um, that takes ESG into account must consider specific categories of stakeholders, uh, including you know, employees, um, local communities, and other potentially impacted groups. And finally, I'll talk about capacity building through customized anti-bribery training. Um, you know, review training programs, and ensure that they are customized for the company, uh, its business environment with key considerations of the local nuances uh, in the markets of operation and its key stakeholders. Um, you know, business environments across the sub-Saharan African region tend to tend to vary, and this goes hand in hand with local nuances that uh, pose various corruption risks. So relevant training programs are a key source of awareness uh, of all the stakeholders dealing with the organization. So while for many companies, the business case for attracting ESG investors is as powerful as deterrence from the costly and commercially damaging impacts of an anti-bribery um, uh, enforcement action. Great, thank you so much, Busani, and uh, well done for getting through the, uh, the gate crashes that Clara had uh, behind her as you were talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, look, uh, that was super interesting. Thank you so much. Um, we've talked about biodiversity loss. We've talked about bribery and corruption. Um, I would like to now move on to gender equality, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Before I do that, I realized that in my eagerness to introduce Basani and Clara, I forgot to introduce myself. So to set my sort of my views in context, I guess, I'll explain. Um, obviously, my name is Catherine Fletcher. I've been with Control Risks for uh, more than eight years now. And I've spent, I'm from the UK, but I spent a large part of my time with Katoris in the Middle East, uh, working on uh, social impact issues. And I'm now based in Johannesburg and I've been living here for about nine months. So I'm still getting uh, integrated into the African lifestyle, which is exciting. Um, anyway, so we'll move on and talk about gender equality. Uh, it's something that affects all of us in every aspect of our lives. But I'm particularly interested today to focus on the negative social impacts that can be caused by gender equality in the world of work and how it relates to venture capital and private equity investments. But before we get into more detail, let's do another quick poll. Okay, so research shows that as a global average, the pay gap between men and women is 24%. So that is women with similar education and other relevant characteristics earning 24% less 
then their male counterparts doing the same work. What do you think the pay gap is? And I think we're missing some text there, but we're asking about what do you think the pay gap is in Southern Africa specifically? So what do you think the pay gap is in Southern Africa? Okay, 38%, interesting. Okay, so the correct answer is actually 30%, uh, which does mean that the, uh, unfortunately, the Southern Africa Customs Union is the most unequal region in the world compared to that 24% average globally. But interestingly, for those of you who chose 38%, you should know that that is the percentage pay gap in South Africa specifically. So as you can see, there's still a lot of work to be done by African companies on this topic. Moving on from pay equality, there's also the issue of equality of opportunity. When it comes to investment, studies show that the average female entrepreneur receives investment capital of $935,000 compared to $2.1 million for the average male entrepreneur. Why should that be the case? Maybe there is a perception that female entrepreneurs are riskier than men. I read an article recently about a female entrepreneur in the UK who set up a highly successful business selling healthy snacks. After 10 years of great sales, she wanted to expand the company and was looking for private equity. She was pregnant at the time. And so on the advice of friends and her business mentors, she went to great lengths to hide the pregnancy throughout the fundraising process. Why? because she didn't want to be seen as a risk. Oh, apologies, I have a, we have an eco-friendly building in here. So if I don't move, we're gonna lose the lighting and I'm just gonna to have to wave my hands now and again, <laughs> uh, as I was saying. So she didn't want to be seen as a risk uh, through that fundraising process. And so she hid her pregnancy. And when you consider that only 1% of UK venture funding goes to female teams, then you can see why she was so worried. So now that we've got a good rounding of these three ESG issues, I'd like to discuss some of the risks that exist for businesses that create negative impacts or don't successfully manage risks around biodiversity loss, gender equality, and anti-bribery and corruption. Asani, I'm going to come to you first, please. Uh, thanks, Catherine. So I think I'll start by saying, you know, if you don't have a comprehensive system of governance in your organization that you know adequately captures ABC risks. So you're going to be more exposed to local uh, and international legislation that regulates these risks. Um, so this can have legal, you know, financial and reputational implications. Um, you know, one of the most extreme examples is sanctions violations. Um, you know, and if you've if you found to have partnered with a company that has um, hidden political or sanctions exposure you know, through, uh, say, uh, opaque um, ultimate benef beneficial ownership, you know, you can be in violation of, you know, international, uh, international sanctions leading to fines, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars and, you know, untold reputational damage. Um, so we've obviously seen a, a lot of panic about this since the start of the, you know, Russia-Ukraine war, uh, but frankly, corruption risks in a similar vein exists, you know, everywhere in Africa too. So one of the most common case studies, um, you know, and that a lot of the uh, people in the audience will be familiar with is the state of this, you know, it's the State Capture Commission that has recently been concluded in South Africa, you know, which investigated allegations of corrupt practices by, you know, various private owned organizations operating locally, sorry, locally and globally. Um, in some instances, we saw, you know, some, some of these organizations close their global operations because of the negative publicity and, you know, the financial dent uh, as a result of their alleged um, involvement in corrupt practices, uh, as highlighted during the, uh, the Commission's hearings. Great, thank you, Bisani. Clara, anything to add from your side? Yeah, so thanks, thanks about everybody. And uh, yeah, sorry that I had to move. Um, if the window people have gone now. <laughs> um, so I've touched on this briefly already, um, but the number one risk to us, and this sounds melodramatic and maybe in the context of this meeting, but I mean, it is, it is just the case. Uh, the number one risk to us as humanity in not addressing biodiversity loss is the impact it'll have on our free and necessary ecosystem services. And then this feeds into every other risk that organizations will face um, and that investors and um, investing companies alike would choose to report on for their shareholders or stakeholders. So for example, reputational risk is a likely outcome of biodiversity loss. 
civil society um, will hold organizations responsible for biodiversity loss and their accompanying, accompanying negative local effects accountable through media campaigns. Um, another key risk to consider is financial. The negative impacts of biodiversity loss will make it more expensive for you to do business in the area, especially if you're contributing to the uh, compromisation of the free ecosystem services. Um, so for example, if you have to engage in any sort of retroactive environmental safeguarding, um, or if you, so for example, cleaning up from pollution or spills or that sort of thing, um, or if you lose clients as a result of the aforementioned negative media attention, another key risk is litigatory. So civil society um, is increasingly seeking legal represent representation to sue companies accused of causing undue biodiversity loss, which has the added bonus of being another financial risk. Um, all of these are intertwined risks, um, which then have a multiplier effect, which I think Catherine is going to quickly talk about now too. That's right, thank you, Clara. Yeah, so what's really interesting to me is that with most negative social impacts, something called intersectionality comes into play. And by that, we mean the overlapping and in interdependent social categorizations that working together can either create additional advantages or worsen disadvantage. So thinking about gender inequality and biodiversity, there is intersectionality at play here. For example, according to the OECD, as of 2014, there were 102 countries in the world whose laws or customary practices restrict women's rights to access land. When women don't have equal access to land and other key resources, their opportunity and capacity to play an active role in biodiversity con conservation is severely limited. So as Clara mentioned, there's a multiplier, multiplier effect. Basically one problem becomes two or more. So if we think about what that means, for example, investments in infrastructure development or mining, where land rights could be an issue, and frequently is an issue, companies may need to go above and beyond the local law. As I said, the laws there may not support women to have access to, to land. And by, by getting involved in ensuring that women have those equal rights to access land, doing so could enable them to uh, provide additional benefits around biodiversity conservation, which is again, a win-win effectively. Okay, so let's think a little bit now more about positive impacts and what opportunities exist for businesses when they manage those three risks that we've been talking about. Um, and even better, you know, let's create positive impacts. Let's do more than just manage risks, right? So Bisani, I'm gonna to come to you first. What are your thoughts around that? Well, I'd say that, you know, strong corporate governance um, centered around ABC is, you know, the backbone of uh, embedded sustainability. So, um, you know, every organization operating in Africa uh, should ensure that it has robust policies to, you know, to not only ensure it operates with integrity, but, you know, that it creates impact too. Um, so strong corporate governance should create policies that prohibit and regulate bad corporate behavior, of course, you know, such as corruption and theft, but also should, you know, incentivize shareholders and stakeholders to reach certain goals, um, you know, such as biodiversity protection or the number of women employed. You know, so corporate governance is one of the strongest tools in the organization's toolkit to, you know, creating more uh, purposeful and impactful companies, uh, you know, leading to reputational and, 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 you know, financial benefits. Yeah, okay, interesting. And so, I mean, from my point of view, the, the multiplier effect that I was just referring to um, is an opportunity as well, right? Because it works both ways. So, you know, thinking about the fact that if you do a little bit of good in one area, you're going to create a kind of a, a, a knock-on effect, which is also positive in, in other aspect, aspects as well. So if we look at non-financial reporting, for example, um, which many companies are spending increasing time on, there are benefits to addressing gender equality issues. For example, when companies address gender-related impacts in connection with their business, they could be helping to achieve up to 11 sustainable development goals simultaneously, which is quite a lot. <laughs> um, and obviously, as many companies report annually on their contribution towards the sustainable development goals, if you're taking proactive steps to address gender uh, inequality, then you could encourage investors to provide future funding. Um, and the positive impacts aren't just limited to sustainability reports, you know, picking up on Busani's 
earlier comments about um, senior management and board commitment to ESG when it comes to financial performance, companies with strong female representation on their boards are 28% more likely to outperform their peers. And gender, uh, gender diversity in executive teams increases the chance of outperformance by 25%. So with those sorts of numbers, uh, mainstreaming gender equality within companies stops being a nice to have and starts being an essential tool in ensuring a successful and profitable business. So going back to my earlier example of the, the female entrepreneurs receiving significantly less capital than men, um, in reality, that same study showed that female founded companies delivered twice as much revenue per dollar invested as male founded firms. And these impressive ROIs may explain the huge rise in gender lens investing in recent years, with some estimates claiming a fourfold growth in the number of funds allocating capital with a gender lens. In fact, conservative estimates suggest that a total capital of $6 billion was raised for gender lens funds as of mid-2021. So when you look at the impact that venture capital and private equity funds can have by, uh, by applying a gender lens to their investment process and their portfolio management, it's huge. Um, and I know, for example, that some funds have targets to ensure that 100% uh, of their portfolio companies have a gender policy, um, others will focus on targets to increase female employment. And I think the, the nice thing about all of these approaches is they will have real world impacts. Um, Clara, I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, so I'm just going to echo Catherine here and say that you'll save yourself time and money and potentially give yourself a reputational edge over your competitors, as well as unlocking new sources of financing by figuring out what impact your operations are having on local biodiversity before, not to sound flippant, but some NGO does. And even better, do the right studies and engage the right people to help you manage these risks before you even break, break ground on construction of the asset or you know, engaging with the asset at all. Uh, then when you report and start considering how biodiversity feeds into the embedded sustainability strategy of your organization, you'll be able to say that you're working towards the relevant SDGs or IFC performance standard six, which is focused on biodiversity, or GRI standard 304, also focused on biodiversity. So making you compliant with whatever reporting frameworks you're working with, um, and therefore attractive to new clients and funding sources. And again, this is just talking about reporting and making sure that you as an organization um, are doing the right thing by your corporate governance uh, obligations um, without even touching on all the other impacts that it'll have, the positive impacts it'll have uh, for the planet and the, you know, the people that you are working with on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, look, just picking up on what you said there around working towards, I think that's really important. Um, ESG is, is huge and it's complex and that intersectionality that I referred to earlier means that it's not easy to, um, to solve these issues, but if you make efforts, you can, as I said, have kind of those, those knock-on uh, positive uh, impacts. I think it's also important to, to recognize that um, it's a work in progress and for a lot of companies, um, it's really just, it's taking steps to recognize the risks and, and make improvements and work towards whether it's, you know, improved compliance or just trying to align with international best practice, but it takes time and it takes effort. And I actually just think it might be worth um, just discussing a little bit around the kind of the realities of actually monitoring and measuring progress against these three risks. So um, Clara, if you're okay to, to pick up on this first, what it would be interesting to think through is how can companies um, make sure that the efforts that they're making around biodiversity loss are, are really having an impact and then actually making change? What can they do? Well, I think really maybe the message that I'd want everybody to hear to take away is you just have to start somewhere. You just have to get on that path. Um, it doesn't matter. Well, it, it will matter eventually how much progress you're making, but I think everybody, uh, at least what we're hearing from our clients, you know, investors and corporates alike are feeling really overwhelmed. You know, there are such a plethora of frameworks and um, re legislative requirements and everything is kind of coming at everybody quite quickly. And I think 
um, the it can be tempting to just say I you know it's it's too much I, I I can't deal with this at all but you can and there are so many small steps you can take so you know decide on what SDGs for example you'd be interested in pursuing for example life on water or life on land those are two great ones to focus on with biodiversity um, take a look if you are acquiring an asset or you know working with a company that has an asset that at one point commissioned uh, an environmental impact assessment or an environmental and social impact assessment, try and take a look at that assessment and see what it came up with um, about biodiversity in the local area. Um, you know, go and visit the asset yourself, go on the ground. I think that for a lot of us working in the consulting investor spaces, we are pretty removed sometimes from the assets that we that we engage with and that we invest in. And it's really important to go and, and see for yourself what's going on there. Go talk to the people in the local communities. Um, the amount of information that you'll be able to gather from these kinds of visits and these kinds of face-to-face -face interactions is, I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's, it'll go so far beyond anything that you'll be able to learn from, you know, doing your own kind of Googling or, um, you know, speaking to maybe the, the, the management structure of, of whatever asset you're talking, you're, you're, you're working with. Um, and you'll be able to get the answers you want quite quickly. And then from there, you can, you can come up with an action plan. And this can be uh, starting as small as just appointing somebody on your board or within your organization who maybe is also taking a look at how you're going to work towards your net zero emissions uh, goals and making sure that they're also taking a look at biodiversity as well, because as I've said, they feed quite neatly into each other. Um, so it can be as small as a step as, as that, you know, employing and targeting resources towards this issue. And then thinking about if they're, you know, through your informal conversations or through the, the looks that you're having through documentation that's already been obtained on this issue, such as an EIA, and you've identified any issues, just start thinking about how you're going to address it. Um, are there ways that you can restructure the way that your asset is, is performing um, in order to, to preserve local biodiversity. So for example, if you are working with a power station and maybe its power lines aren't as insulated as they could be, um, thus leading to the electrocution of buzzards and vultures in Kenya, um, a really simple solution that would be to go, and again, I'm not an environmental expert, but I mean, to go and, and encourage that manager and that company to invest in uh, more insulation for its power lines. I mean, that's just a you know one small thing you can do, and then you're reporting on that, you're building on that. You you know, if somebody in your company who's who's focusing on that issue and feeding it into your annual sustainability reports, if that's how you're choosing to report, um, or into the TCFD, and you know your future looking, um, your the future valuation of your asset and how it's going to increase in value because you've taken these um, biodiversity considerations into account. Um, and you go from there. So it's all about the small steps and and working with information and resources that you already have to start. Yeah, Tara, I absolutely agree with what you're saying around um, that sort of on the ground presence and understanding of the risks. Um, I know that we recently supported uh, a client in the mining sector. We went along um, to a prospective uh, site of theirs and you know what you can achieve in just that one visit in terms of speaking with stakeholders you know we had conversations with um, a security company that had been guarding that site and you can start to have conversations around social impacts you know they are employees what's their situation around pay what's their working conditions you know it's it doesn't even have to be something that's um, sort of super formalized of, of course that's that's in some ways preferable but really just being there and seeing for yourself, you know, what are the impacts on the stakeholders um, around this particular um, asset or company um, is really important. I absolutely agree with you. Bisani, um, coming to you then, what would be your thoughts on this? So I think, you know, one of the things I'd emphasize the most and, uh, you know, uh, a takeaway from our discussion is that um, you know while boards are accountable for risk governance, you know it's with really the it's the senior management which is required to drive the uh, you know the culture of uh, ethical business and ensuring that you know sustainability is embedded in the organisation through policies and governance. Um, now I know that um, the extent to which uh, an investor can impact and influence uh, how a, a management team in an investee company operates may vary, uh, you know, depending on the nature of the transaction. 
But I think embedded within the KPIs of the, the performance of that, uh, you know, what will become a portfolio company needs to be, um, you know, not just consideration about the financial performance of the business, but, you know, without doubt, the extent to which the management team has been able to, you know, effectively drive, um, you know, the ethical and sustainability considerations that they need to in order to be, um, you know, abiding by the, um, you know, the broader uh, the broad obligations that they, you know, they need to consider from an ESG perspective. So it, it's really about, you know, can can you uh, as an investor, you know, hold uh, the management teams, uh, you know, feet to the fire, and make sure that um, they appreciate that uh, it's not a question of just, you know, how well is the business doing financially, um, but what is, uh, how is that business impacting, um, uh, you know, its local community, local surroundings, um, and is that a net positive for the business um, in terms of how it operates and, you know, how it's viewed as a, as a responsible organization operating in that particular sector. Absolutely, yeah. No, I agree with you, Basani. And I think the only thing I would add is that from my experience, um, certainly in the Middle East and also now with Africa as well, um, super important to have that um, accountability at the board level and, and senior management to really buy into these ideas. What I would add is that I often find that there is that, that buy-in and commitment at the, at the top level. Um, and actually, there is a gap, which is actually more at the kind of the slightly uh, junior level um, in terms of how things are implemented. So it, it will be um, supervisors, middle management, who may be totally unaware of the company's position on these issues. Policies may exist, they may not be well um, communicated or implemented. Um, I can give you examples just from a sort of the, the, the labor rights um, and working conditions aspect where we have uh, clients who are absolutely committed to ensure that working conditions are compliant with local legislation, but also meet international best practice. But if there are supervisors or middle managers who are really not cited on, on this commitment um, or, or it's not been explained to them how important it is on a day-to-day -day basis, those policies will not be implemented on the ground. And that's where we have seen, you know, workers who are not being treated correctly, who are not even aware of the, the benefits and, and rights that they have through their employment. So that's where you start to find that the realities on the ground are not what you thought they would be because this, of this disconnect between policies and, and the kind of governance at the top and realities on the ground. And I wonder, Pisani, Clara, does that kind of resonate with either of you from your experience as well? Well, from my side, without doubt, um, the, I mean, it's a common issue around, um, you know, uh, having great policies at like a, say, a senior, well, senior management or headquarter level, but, you know, the lack of implementation on the ground. Um, and that's something that, you know, our clients are, you know, they, they, they may be cognizant of at the beginning of a transaction, but what I often find is that they lose sight of it. Um, as you know, after the transaction is complete and 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 they're they're fully invested. So you know, what I always say to our clients is, uh, it's all well and fine, uh, you know, ticking the box in terms of like making sure that the policies are in place. Um, it's another matter of you know making sure that there's that ongoing monitoring that's going on to make sure that that the implementation is being done on a on a day to day basis. So yeah, something to to consider um, as to where do your responsibilities end? Well, certainly not at the end of the transaction or when the investment is made. Um, it, it kind of persists throughout uh, the life uh, of that investment. Absolutely. And Basani, why do you think, Clara, I'll come to you in a second. Basani, why do you think companies don't do that kind of ongoing monitoring? Because it seems so obvious to us. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it's time, resources, you know, um, if, if, you know, for a lot of our clients, they they make the investment and you know they look to the next transaction. Um, and yeah, it's you know it just may, it may be a matter of uh, a change in focus. It may be available resources, um, but I think you know it, it, my 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 consideration would be if the risks of you know not doing the right uh, uh, you know due diligence prior to the transaction are so apparent. Um, in, you know, you know, at the beginning stage of the transaction, it should be thought that the risk kind of dissipate when, uh, when the, uh, you know, the transaction is done and the, and the, and the investment is live. So, you know, for me, it's just a, it makes sense that clients should, you know, 
had that same awareness of the risk profile of the investment um, that they have at the beginning or throughout the life cycle. I mean, that's a really good point. The context hasn't changed, actually. Yeah. It, the, the environment in which a project or an investment is sort of being created um, has not necessarily changed. So that risk needs to be managed throughout, as, as you said. Uh, a good example just popped into my mind as, as you were talking, Busani. Again, it's actually mining related, but I think it's, it's, it's an interesting one of um, a mining company that was at the beginning of, of the project had gone through a huge amount of effort around stakeholder engagement. They'd really uh, you know, interacted with the local communities that were going to be impacted um, and, and they did a good job. And I think that was, that was you know, a good starting point. But the problem is these are very long-term projects, you know, not just sort of a few years, but it can be decades. And when the mine came to want to expand its footprint, they didn't go to the same lengths to engage with stakeholders as they had done at the beginning of the project. I think there was almost an assumption that that sort of social license to operate was just in place and everything was fine and why would they need to go back and do more? Mm. But it backfired and there were problems. And I think it's one of those things where you can't take your eye off of these issues and they will continue to be there because as, as we said, that context is, is still there. Yeah. Clara, thank you for waiting patiently. I'm gonna to come to you now. No, I don't have too much to add. I think, you know, if you don't monitor, the, I mean, the ultimate answer here is that your asset is going to lose value. And that's what we're seeing with um, frameworks like the TCFD that are asking you to build in, um, you know, the future value of your assets it, it, with the TCFD and specifically in relation to climate change and the impacts that climate change will have on, on the assets value. But um, if you're not engaging with these issues, um, on a regular basis, um, you're you're going to be in trouble ultimately, and that's what we're seeing. I mean, the climate again. I'm coming at this from from the E point of view, but the climate is going to continue to change. Southern Africa is going to continue uh, to bear the brunt of of climate related, um, you know, extreme weather and, and natural disasters um, in the across the world. And so, um, not taking these issues into account, not monitoring how your organization is engaging with them on a regular basis is is, is, yeah, it's gonna cost you. Um, I think one interesting thing that I've been reading quite a lot about, which may not be too welcome by the senior executives in the audience, but um, something that lots of organizations are starting to consider is tying executive pay to sustainability outcomes. And that's something that we may see more increasingly as, as, as a way to incentivize um, organizations to, to truly take these issues seriously and you know, start implementing um, programs in place that monitor and track these issues and are constantly working towards um, improving their, their ESG uh, metrics. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, and look, and I think just again, as a personal example here, um, you know, living in South Africa, we do see um, biodiversity risks all around us on, on an everyday basis. Um, just recently, I was in a park close to where I live, and you could see uh, industrial waste really just flowing down the river in that park from a factory nearby um, and you have to wonder um, really what 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 the company is doing or not doing <laughs> yeah they must have they must know that they are obviously dumping um, what is toxic waste into waterways and how incredibly damaging that is but unfortunately you know there are other there are other factors at play here you know there are enforcement issues around local law, um, corruption, as we mentioned, you know, can be relevant in some cases as well. So um, you know, complex issues, but there's no doubt, as we've said right at the beginning, that the onus is on companies and it's on investors to, to manage these risks. Um, the governments uh, of the world will legislate, uh, they, they may enforce, but there's also that sort of uh, bottom-up approach, if you like, of making sure that companies are doing the right thing. Okay. I think now we are ready to take some questions. And Tanya, uh, if we can bring you in at this point, um, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate you must be very busy, uh, but it's great to have you. Uh, I hope you found that as an interesting discussion as well. Um, and, and please, you know, if you'd like to guide us through um, a Q&A, that would be fantastic. Great, thanks Catherine, Bassani and Clara, really enjoyed that. Uh, we have a question that came in from Samantha Pockroy. I'm going to give an opportunity to ask a question in person and maybe just give some additional context to that question. Sam, over to you. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I had a, a question uh, which was on the pay gap, um, which you mentioned, Catherine, at the beginning. Um, but if, if you don't mind, I, I want to just actually 
put it into four parts, seems a bit long, but um, the one was, you know, is there, a, is there a difference in the pay gap at different levels of seniority? Then how does that combine with the different levels of representation? Because it's one thing to be paid less, but actually there's probably a far fewer women um, being you know, at the senior levels in the first instance. Um, and then I suppose the, the really important um, part of it is, I know that like in the UK, they publish gender pay gaps for, for all public companies, or I think it's even all types of, certain types of companies have to disclose it. What do we have in South Africa, Southern Africa, Africa? And then here's the crux of it. What is the methodology for the gender pay gap, right? And how would private equity practitioners drive this agenda in our portfolio companies, right? So is there a standard methodology that incorporates all of these previous points I've made that we can put onto a, an agenda and actually have disclosed in a standardized way? And, you know, what have you seen? I mean, is it, is it you know, there's a, there's a pay gap and you, you say, well, change the pay gap, right? Um, just make it zero, right? Adjust salaries. Um, obviously this needs to go through all of private equity's traditional um, portfolio management and, and governance practices. But, you know, is, that, is, is it as simple as, as, as driving towards the measurement, the monitoring, and then an, an actual, you know, commitment that you secure with your, with your portfolio teams to actually bring this down to, to zero? Great, that's, thank you for a very detailed uh, question. And I'm gonna try and cover each of those points as you've mentioned them, Sam. So starting off with the, the, the study that I mentioned, um, I didn't see it go into specific details around the different levels of seniority. I can speak from sort of my personal experience and, and knowledge. Oh, here we go again. Excuse me, I'm gonna wave my hands while the uh, lights come back on hopefully. Um, as I said, this is the benefit of living in an eco or living or working in an eco-friendly environment. There we go. Hopefully we'll come back in a moment. Um, there we go. So, okay, so on, on the different levels of seniority, as you would expect, that gap increases the more senior the roles are in, in a company. Um, unfortunately, um, it's, it's often the case that at the more the junior level, um, and I'm thinking about, for example, in the construction industry, although there's not as many women there, maybe it's more like sort of FMCG, um, you will find that there is actually quite a good similarity in, in terms of pay uh, between men and women for, for more sort of junior roles, or for example, um, I would say sort of lower skilled, but, but roles that require uh, fewer qualifications, for example. I think as you start to get into more senior roles, um, it, it seems that that gap widens. Um, and certainly once you get into that kind of management level, then you can really see quite substantial gaps. Um, as to the reasons for that, I can only speculate. I think some of it has to do with the fact that women may go off and have children. They may take gaps in their careers. They may become carers in some respect, whether it's for elderly parents or for as I say, children. And in some ways it's almost like they are left behind. Um, so yeah, the, I think it is, it is complex um, in terms of the, the different levels there. Representation, of course, you know, if you don't have many women taking on those senior roles, um, then there isn't the opportunity to, to sort of make sure that they are getting paid the same as their male counterparts. But I think this study was, was looking specifically at, and to your point around sort of methodology, they were, they were trying to look at like for like as much as possible. So, you know, people who do have the same characteristics and the same experience, um, it's impossible to be exactly, you know, matched, of course, between, between different people. But um, I think the study was trying to take that into consideration. So, you know, despite that, um, and I can even say from my own experience that you do see people who on paper look as though they have very similar, um, you know, qualifications and experience, a similar number of years uh, of experience in, you know, in a particular sector who are not getting paid the same salaries. So that it definitely is real. Um, interestingly, as you say, around the UK and, and the way that they've gone with publishing uh, information on uh, gender um, pay, pay and sort of highlighting those gaps where there exist. I'm not aware of anything personally in, in South Africa 
Basani, Clara, please jump in if you are aware of anything similar around this point. No? Okay, so maybe this is something that's going to come in the future. And if anyone else, by the way, who's on this call um, knows of anything, please do jump in, because it's very interesting to hear. Um, in terms of how companies address this, and I think it's really important, some, you know, the question that you asked around, what do we do about this? You know, we, we, if we find an issue, and, and it, it, it's a review that needs to take place, and we do work with companies on this, where they're actually looking at what they call wage studies, effectively. So they are looking at you know, for, whether it's for their suppliers or whether it's in their own business, looking at that sort of the pay structures um, and, and trying to understand where they sit. Now, it's pretty complex. I have to say, you know, if we start talking about things like living wage, fair wage, minimum wage, it's, it's really complex. And a lot of this involves actually kind of economic calculations. Um, what, what I generally say to companies is start with that measure, start with trying to understand um, where you're at right now with those gaps. Um, but then I think the next thing is the commitment. It is committing to working towards pay parity. In some cases, it is not possible for a company to immediately address an issue by changing salaries to, to bring them up to, you know, to the exact same level. If you have very large companies or if this is something you're doing in your supply chain, it takes time, there are, knock-on effects that need to be considered in terms of costs and things like that. So generally companies recognize the issue, identify that it is a problem, and then commit to working towards parity over a period of years. It can take a long time to address these uh, balances. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things I was going to say on that. But again, Pisani, Clara, if you have any thoughts, please do jump in. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Clara Bassani, you're more than welcome to jump in. I've just uh, posted a link in the chat about a uh, gender pay gap pilot that I found that the National Business Initiative undertook last year. And I know from a representation perspective, but this is JC listed companies, uh, Business Engagement 30% Club also uh, published a report to look at the gender representation on boards um, of these listed companies. So those are some additional resources. Clara, anything you'd like to add? No, I was just going to say, uh, Catherine, that was a really comprehensive answer. <laughs> um, Catherine, while we're on this, the topic of um, inequality or gender uh, inequality, um, what do you think is the single biggest change um, that we need to affect on the African continent to improve uh, gender mm. equality? Yes, I mean, that's, uh, gosh, where to start? Just one. <laughs> um, I, I think, honestly, it has to be around the informal sector. Uh, the informal sector here is huge. And it's something I've really noticed, you know, having, having moved here less than a year ago, um, is, is there is a huge reliance on informal labor. Um, and women are, are a big part of that. I think I read somewhere that something like 70% of the informal sector is women. Um, and the problem with that is that when you have women contributing work in that informal way, they are not benefiting from any of the sort of safety nets uh, or provisions that exist for people who have employment contracts uh, or have union representation. They're really just excluded from all of that. And that means that any changes that happen, any improvements like the ones we just talked about with, with trying to address uh, pay parity, they're just not benefiting from them. They are totally excluded from all of those developments. Um, and the scale is so huge that if you did address it, if you made some of these areas of work you know, formalized, um, it would actually immediately address a really, you know, on a large scale, um, the, exactly the issues that we've been talking about. And Catherine, you also mentioned um, uh, some perceptions about women and uh, ability of women to progress, et cetera. Um, are there any unconscious bias that you think women faced, whether they are uh, raising funds, whether they're entrepreneurs, whether they're climbing the corporate ladder, anything that you've come across in terms of that you've seen are some unconscious biases? I mean, I definitely think, unfortunately, that when it comes to women as caregivers, that is still seen as a risk. You know, that example I gave of, of the woman who had to hide or felt that she had to hide her pregnancy because she felt that 
or con was concerned that you know the pregnancy would mean that she was seen as someone who wouldn't be uh, fully focused on on the work in hand you know would be would be taking time off or, or kind of otherwise um preoccupied I think that is it's obviously quite um insulting <laughs> frankly and I you know I think it's unfortunate that it's still seen as as the default that you know women are caregivers uh, and, and again it, that could also relate to to elderly parents or to uh people who are you know sort of within the family network or within the household who are sick or in need of some kind of extra care, it will be the woman who, who deals with that. And I think it's almost baked in now as an assumption that if something happens, the woman will be the one who goes and addresses that. And in some ways then they're seen as not being you know, fully focused on, on their jobs. Um, I mean, Clara Pisani, I'd also like to bring you in on this because I think you, you will maybe have different experiences. Um, yeah, Catherine, <clears throat> look, what, what I wanted to say was, uh, you know, in response to the question of like, how can we make the improvements necessary in this space in Africa, I think there has to be really, uh, you know, the strong consideration of the, the, the local nuances and, and, and things that impact women, especially outside of the workplace, you know, so what are the expectations from, uh, you know, family, what are their responsibilities outside of the workforce, uh, and how can companies, um, do their bit in accommodating, um, you know, some of those, um, so some of the necessities that uh, women need to uh, to meet. So, you know, things like proactively, you know, engaging with, uh, you know, female employees around things like um, maternity leave and maternity pay and the like, uh, you know, making it much easier for women uh, to to you know. Uh, uh, to contribute outside of the workforce, you know, in, in terms of their family life and community life, uh, but in a way that uh, is facilitated by companies being more flexible uh, around, um, you know, giving space and time to uh, to women to do these things. So, yeah, I just think that it's it's, it's quite important to be cognizant of, um, you know, some some of the very traditional and you know often patriarchal uh, societies that you know uh, women are. You know, working with them uh, and making sure that companies are doing the the necessary and taking the necessary proactive steps uh, to to um, to make things as easy as they can for, for women. If, if I may, it's it's I think it really just all comes down to value, right? We need to start thinking about how we value capital differently, and that that's what ESG is is really all about. And that's up into the into GDP. How do we calculate GDP, and why does it not take into account social capital? So you know, the, the interactions that occur between people that create cohesive and productive societies and, and the unpaid and unseen labor that women do outside of and within the workforce in order to ensure that everything runs smoothly to natural capital. So again, the free ecosystem services that we all rely on that allow us to live our lives and, and go to work every day, um, none of this is being valued correctly. And so until we do that, and that's what ESG is trying to do, um, we're going to continue to live in these in unequal and non-inclusive societies. Um, and that's that those are the big questions that we all really need to reckon with, I think. Sorry, Catherine, you can go. No, I was just gonna say there's some really interesting um, examples in the development sort of space around um, the, the kind of lessons that they've had to learn about women and the, their role in the household. And I remember there was um there was sort of a trend, if you like, of saying that, okay, when we're going to kind of undertake development projects in remote parts of Africa, we will, um, we will give kind of microfinancing to the, the head of the household, the man, and we'll give him the land and we'll make sure that, uh, you know, that we're trying to improve quality of life and, and bring people out of poverty. What they actually found that was by excluding women, they didn't have the, um, the kind of positive impacts that they were expecting because the woman's role in the household, they had, they had failed to understand it entirely. They had misunderstood the way that women will be involved in agriculture or will be involved in managing the sort of the finances for the household. And they just assumed coming, particularly with, a, I'm afraid, a Western patriarchal view, the man is the head of the household and therefore the money should go to him. And when they realized it wasn't working, they sort of said, okay, now we need to actually look at, you know, what they call mainstreaming gender equality, basically. Hmm. It's marketing 101. Know who gets the money, but who ultimately makes the decision at the end of the day. Exactly. Um, Clara, I just want to uh, change gears a bit and go back to biodiversity. Um, interestingly, 
Africa is uh, together with the WWF is publishing a case study on biodiversity investment in our conference publication. Um, so I was very interested in, in some of the comments that you've made, but I just wanted to ask um, what are the risks and opportunities of investing in natural capital in Africa that you've seen? Um, I love this question because there are so many opportunities right now. I think, you know, we've all been hopefully cl closely following the issuance of the rhino bonds um, in South Africa, um, and there's going to be more opportunities like that. So, you know, one of the first ones is conservation. So protecting forests, wetlands, grasslands, mountain ranges, um, and the revenue that will stream from that either through tourism or carbon offsets, uh, sustainable forestry. So forestry that doesn't just rely on monoculture plantations and enhances biodiversity that again can be used for carbon offsets as well as promoting the livelihoods of local peoples and all of the accompanying income streams that can come from that. Uh, regenerative agriculture, so making sure that you're investing in farmland that employs regenerative practices like no, no tilling, crop cover all year round, grazing, foraging, um, and I think that we know that studies are, are showing that along with contributing to higher levels of carbon sequestration, they also, re regenerative, ag regenerative agriculture also produces better yields because the soil is healthier and you know, there's a lot of, of uh, work going into this right now. Um, and all of this is, you know, so applicable to Africa, given its plethora of, of wildlife and, and, and you know, protected areas and wild spaces. Um, I think the risks, one of the key risks that I'm really worried about in the next few years, um, mostly relates to carbon offsets and the integrity of carbon offsets. So um, as we see a lot of companies um, that are trying to say that they're on the, the path to net zero emissions, but are trying to not really um, address any of the, the structural um, issues within their organizations, such as you know, scoping their one to three emissions or, or conducting um, auditing of their scope one to three emissions, um, are trying to, to kind of get there faster by, by just buying carbon offsets. Um, and I think it's important that we make sure that we're looking at the integrity of the offsets um, as well as where that strategy plays into your, for example, if you're an investor, your investees overall net zero strategy. So for example, with the asset, with the, what you should be looking for with a carbon offset is what was the land in use for before? So are you investing in a carbon offset that was, that has already been acting as a, you know, biodiverse force for a long time? Is it actually not being converted into land that is going to further sequester carbon from the atmosphere? Is it just kind of doing the same job it's already been doing? Um, so is it being converted into a regenerative landscape? So this is sometimes also known as rewilding, um, or are you just getting credit for a job that's, that's already been done? Um, making sure that local communities are benefiting from the offset or regenerative agricultural practices. Um, if we're talking about conservation, so to bring go back to the rhino bonds again, uh, where is that money going? Are rangers being trained to deal with local communities um, with integrity? What sort of anti-corruption measures are in place to ensure that money set aside for conservation isn't being misappropriated? Um, I think that these are the, the, the key risks that we're all really going to need to take a look at. Um, I mean, and these are just a few. I'd be really interested to hear if the audience um, has dealt with any more of these, particularly in relation to um, their journey uh, looking at carbon offsets recently. Um, but those are just my initial thoughts on that. I'm sorry, um, I also received some messages um, saying that your, your comment about executive pay to sustainability metrics is a really an interesting and intriguing one uh, and something people <laughs> will, will be thinking about. But there's also a question that came in about the role between government and private sector when it comes to um, uh, biodiversity. Who should play what role um, in this sphere or in this space? Well, government's going to have to legislate, you know, they need to implement the policies that are that will be in place that will hold uh, organizations to account. But at the same time, organizations can't sit around and wait for that to happen. They have to take action now. I mean, we, you know, looking at the Paris Agreement, we all know that we have limited time to to make sure that our emissions stay, you know, 1.5% um, or 1.5 degrees Celsius. So it's, um, it's really important that government and organizations are working together, especially if you're an organization that can play uh, a leading role in, in the net zero transition, that you are taking your expertise in that and, and going to government and saying, you know, this is what's worked for us. Um, these are the policies that, you know, you could suggest that other companies implement as well. You can establish your own working groups. Um, there's so many ways to lead 
um, in terms of biodiversity and, and net zero. Um, and I mean, if you're working, if you're working with a government government that maybe yet doesn't have, I don't think this is not the case in South Africa, but maybe in other Southern African countries, um, that maybe doesn't yet have the impetus to to force companies to address their carbon emissions or biodiversity um, in any form of, of really um, urgent way, I think is the way I'd put it, then you can still take action and you can still come across and, and do everything you can to be an industry leader in this. Um, and that will collectively raise the bar and encourage everybody else to take action as well, especially if you are able to show, which studies are showing that you will, that you are increasing your profit margins, you are gaining all these other financial benefits, such as the reputational edge, such as being ahead of any sort of regulations that the government will eventually come out with um, on, on these issues. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, audience, if you've got any specific questions, feel free to raise your hand, um, submit them in the QA box if you don't want to ask them in person. But Fasani, I want to ask you a question about uh, management teams and investee companies. And they, they play a, a very important role in um, establishing a culture of good governance uh, and implementing the right processes. But how, uh, specifically in the due diligence process, or how do you assess their capacity from the outset? What, what are some of the red flags in terms of potential governance risks or concerns uh, that we should look out for? Yeah, thanks, uh, Tanya. Look, I think um, there's no greater, uh, uh, more uh, meaningful way to assess future behavior than looking at past behavior. And so what we look at when we're assisting our clients uh, examine these management teams is, you know, how have they behaved in the past? Have they, uh, you know, what is their track record in terms of the way they've managed uh, their businesses? Have they uh, put at the center of, the, uh, of their their the, the ethos of the company uh, uh, issues around ethics and uh, you know and sustainability in terms of how they um, you know how they conduct the, the company's affairs, and I think also you know what's been useful. I mean, and it's, it's weird to say this, I suppose, in, in the context of the pandemic, but what what we've seen is that clients who have looked at companies. Uh, which have gone through, you know, uh, you know, the pandemic and all the issues that it brought up, is how are these management teams behaving in the moments in which they're under the most pressure? You know, when there is um, the most, um, how can I say, the the most um, pressure on them to meet their, uh, you know, the financial uh, targets and obligations in a very difficult, in you know, uh, economic environment. Um, but at the same time, there are questions around. Okay what kind of decisions were made um, in order to meet those financial objectives and were the decisions made were the decisions that were made uh, detrimental to other parts of you know the objectives of the, of, of the company from a from a ESG perspective from a from an ethical and sustainability perspective and so you know we've seen uh, you know potential targets that our clients have looked at which have uh, you know looked very attractive from a financial perspective but when we drill down into how they behave during the pandemic, um, we can see that you know certain shortcuts were taken, certain sacrifices were made to the detriment of, say, the local labor force. Um, you know, and those decisions were made, uh, you know, with with the financial objectives in mind, but uh, not adequately holding up the other uh, sustainability sustainability um, uh, demands that uh, that should have been uh, you know front of mind. So. You know, examining how these management teams behave in those kind of situations is very indicative of you know what kind of what kind of company they want to run and how they will uh, perform in the future. So it could be very telling in terms of how people behave in a crisis. Um, yeah. So, you know, so look at past behavior, but as you said, it cannot dictate future behavior. Catherine, anything to add from a labor um, rights standpoint? Yeah, um, so actually this is really interesting and I'm going to answer the question with, with a case study. Um, some of you may have heard of a company called Boohoo. So this was a, a UK uh, fast fashion company and there's already an issue on environment, but I'll move on from that. Um, specifically what's interesting here is, is that Boohoo um, really hit the headlines uh, a few years ago now because of um, an investigation that was done into the treatment of workers in the UK who were creating these garments. And what the investigation found was that um, the workers were not even being paid the legal minimum wage in the UK. So it really was, it was a modern slavery um, example, you know, writ large, and it became a huge issue uh, for the company. 
What people may not realize is that after all of that died down, there was a secondary issue, and that was around um, uh, VAT, or sorry, tax fraud and money laundering. Same company. And what it kind of shows to you is that, you know, I don't want to say rotten to the core, that's probably a little bit harsh, but the, these issues are interconnected. And, and if you have a, a management team that doesn't take it seriously and doesn't think that, that you know, complying with legislation, um, whether it's workers or whether it's tax or whatever it may be, you know, if they don't prioritize that over profits and over that kind of short term uh, approach, then, then there are issues throughout the whole business probably. Thanks, Catherine, and thank you for the case study. I think it's always interesting to hear some of the real life stories and examples um, to mm -hmm. illustrate a point. Bustani, I want to ask you, in terms of transparency and governance, will it remain high on the board agenda, uh, given a push for other elements in the, uh, the E and the S as part of the G? I mean, my, my opinion is that um, without doubt, the issues around governance and transparency are uh, more and more being accommodated within the ESG broader risk uh, assessment framework. Uh, and so there's, you know, I don't see a situation where that will fall by the wayside. I think it's a matter of, um, you know, the governance issues taking their rightful place uh, around the E and the S. And, you know, kind of to reiterate what Catherine is saying, you know, you can't look at these issues in, in isolation, in, you know, in isolation. So, you know, failures in governance will have detrimental impacts on, you know, environmental and social governance issues. So, um, you know, it, it, it can't, in my mind, be something that can fall away because it's kind of integral to the, uh, to the, uh, to fully assessing what, um, you know, meeting your, you know, ESG obligations means. Um, so I'm quite positive that, um, you know, governance and transparency will remain uh, a key uh, determinant of, you know, whether a client, uh, whether a company um, is, you know, properly assessing the impact of uh, its activities uh, in a particular sector or business activity. Thanks, Mazzoni. My last question for you, and it's hot off the trail of a Zondo fourth report. Um, so it is about um, anti-barbary and corruption um, uh, measures. And what measures do you think across Africa um, will contribute to better perception scores of corruption on the continent? What are some of your thoughts? I mean, look, ultimately governments uh, need to take the steps necessary to create environments where corruption is not um, impeding things like, uh, you know, uh, foreign investment into their, into their markets. I mean, and this is becoming, um, you know, very evident in, 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 in how investors, you know, quite, uh, quite deliberately Will direct their investments towards markets where um, you know their uh, their ability to maximize the financial potential of an, of, of an investment is not impacted by the leakages that naturally come out of things like corruption. So it's certainly for governments to uh, to be at the forefront of that. Um, and we're seeing some really you know I think positive uh, steps in a number of uh, you know in a number of countries in Africa. And you see this especially when you look at uh, the types of governments that are being elected into power. You know when you look at um, you know, Zambia, or Angola, or, you know, and the like, the, you know, where, where governments are getting into power on the back of uh, commitments to, you know, dealing with issues around corruption. Um, they know that this is a vote winner and they know that uh, having that uh, as the platform upon which they are, are entering into power is also a direct way of benefiting from, um, you know, foreign investment coming into their market. So uh, I think the trend can only be one that is positive. And, you know, naturally, look, you know, there are so many different markets across across Africa that, you know, you couldn't say for, you know, definitively that this is something that will occur at the same pace in each country. But I think the trend is definitely one in which, uh, you know, issues around corruption and dealing with it are becoming front and center of you know, whatever platform, uh, you know, governments are getting into power and sustaining their power. Um, because as we've seen, even in South Africa, um, you know, when issues like corruption are, uh, are not dealt with, it has a, a you know, a negative impact on, obviously, on the, on, the, on the lives of the citizenry, but also in terms of how governments are, you know, perceived and, you know, their ability to maintain power. Um, and, you know, in order to deal with that, uh, and you know, the, the, these issues need to be dealt with. So uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, although I know that these are things that, you know, take a lot of time to, uh, to bear fruit. 
Um, Catherine Bistani, Clara, thank you so much for sharing your insights and for also asking some tough, uh, answering some tough questions. Um, Catherine, I'm going to hand over back to you to do a closing and a wrap up for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya, and really enjoyed uh, answering those questions that you posed to us and definitely thought provoking as well. Um, so I'd also like to echo Tanya's comments, just thank everybody for their time and their participation. Thank you for answering the polls. And by the way, you did very well, actually. I think you got pretty much a 100% hit rate on that, so well done. Um, I also would like to just um, echo Maria's comments right at the beginning about the upcoming SAVCA conference. We're, we'll be there, Vasani and I are both gonna be there, obviously in person in PAL on the 25th and 26th of May. Um, I'm going to be taking part in a panel discussion, which is around the tension between investing for climate change versus social impact. Uh, Basani, you're going to be there too. Uh, can you just share what you're going to be uh, doing yeah. in this session? Thanks, Catherine. Um, so we're going to be dealing with um, remote, um, you know, questions around remote due diligence and whether this is something that can be sustainable through or post the pandemic. I mean, as you know, and I'm sure as many of the audience experienced, uh, you know, with uh, restrictions being in place, it became more and more difficult to carry out the types of due diligence that you'd ordinarily take or, uh, undertake uh, prior to transaction. And many of our clients, uh, you know, adopted innovative ways to uh, to achieve the same outcomes in terms of gaining comfort around, uh, you know, a particular transaction. Uh, and this may have been, uh, you know, through things that could have been done remotely. So the question we'll be looking at is how successful were some of the, uh, the practices that were adopted during the COVID? Um, do during COVID, sorry, and do we see this as being something that will uh, remain in place um, uh, and you know potentially alter the way in which uh, you know pre-transaction due diligence is carried out in the future? Excellent. That sounds really interesting, and and I hope that we will get to see some of you there. Please do come up and say hello if you're there. And uh, I think my lights are going to go out again in a couple of minutes, so it's probably a good time to leave it there. But um, thank you again all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.